it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Tarane Maksudi Zahidi. She received her Bachelor's of Art degree from Azad University in Iran in 1992. Then she moved to the United States in 95. She received her Bachelor's of Science degree from UTSA, University of Texas, San Antonio in 2000. She received her DDS in 2006 from University of Texas Health Science Center, San Antonio, which is the longest dental school name on them. They need to get an editor. The initials of that are U-T-H-S-C-S-A. They well, now it's, UT Den- now it's UT Dentistry. So Okay, so they shortened it. All right. That's right. <laughs> so following graduation, she continued her education and maxillofacial radiology program where she received her certificate on December 2009 and master's of science degree. She has been engaged in patient care as the chief maxillofacial radiologist at nationally recognized imaging center 360 imaging since then. In 2010, she has joined the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio as assistant professor in periodontics department. She received her board certification from the American Academy of Maxillofacial Radiology in 2010. She has maintained private practice and academics since 2009. She has published articles in different areas of radiology. She has delivered presentations nationally on 3D imaging, radiographic interpretation, and technical skills. She has been engaged in multiple areas of patient care, such as evaluation of pathology, trauma, TMJ, implant surgery, maxillofacial reconstruction, craniofacial syndromes, and on and on. Um, But um, she is just passionate about pathology. My first question is, how does a beautiful woman like you become passionate about pathology? Was this just morbid curiosity? Uh, Yes, I think I'm a a problem solver all my life. I've been like that. And um, I did dentistry when I first started um, dental school. I wanted to be a pediatric dentist. And um, uh, after a couple of years, I didn't even know radiology existed. Um, After a couple of years, I went to, uh, believe it or not, a... um, uh, Halloween party, and I met a lady uh, <laughs> there, and she said, I'm a radiologist and a dentist. I'm like, how that could happen, you know? And then she introduced uh, maxillofacial radiology to me. We were talking, and, you know, she said, if you want to come down, uh, she was still a resident, um, Dr. Mardini. And um, I went there, and I look around. At that time, um, Combeam City was not uh, a big of a deal. They were working on tomography and things like that, and I saw um, so many amazing cases that she was working on, and I, I just got kind of interested. Um, I wasn't thinking on going to the residency, um, but, you know, because I was older when I graduated from dental school, um, I thought about, you know, going to maybe pediatric, and then I thought about it, you know, maybe I can do a little bit of a radiology because it's more flexible. I can, you know, if something happens, you know, you know what happens with dentists, you have an accident, you cannot work anymore. So, um, I said maybe, you know, because I'm older, I can go to uh, 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 do a specialty that I can practice a little bit longer. Um, so I just shadowed her for a while and just fell in love. And I saw, you know, pathology, the things that we can find, um, you know, sometimes incidental findings that could save lives. And that was, um, that's what everything got started there. Um, I was thinking about just doing residency and doing general dentistry for a while. Um, and then when I couldn't work anymore, I could go to, to um, radiology, but I fell in love with it so much. Um, right after graduation, I said, I'm going to stay and do this. And then, you know, a comb beam CT came, came along and changed everything. I'm so old. I'm 54 that, you know, I can still remember the coolest thing that happened in uh, Panos is when some genius figured out how to put an R on one side and an L on the other. We all, <laughs> we all thought that was the greatest update we, we, we thought that was the greatest invention in all of oral radiology. When did 3D cone beam really come about and take place and hit dentistry? Well, it started in around 80, 1987, and it wasn't that popular. And they just started working on it. And, uh, you know, they, they, uh, that's the time that it, it started, 87, 1987. And um, it was only for, like, implant. And because of the... Um, you know, tomography uh, was big in, you know, for, for implant tomography was a big, big deal. But the amount of radiation and, um, and uh, you know, the uh, expenses that was involved made people, you know, 
um, kind of geared towards Chrome Beam CT more. And then with the new technology, every year you have a new machine that does a better thing and, you know, less radiation. And, um, and um, that um, helped dentistry a lot. And um, I think that the first machine that was made was in, in um, 1987, but it was transferred from medical CT to, to Chrome Beam CT. Um, and the amount of, it, uh, of the radiation that um, you get exposed to with Combium CT is a lot less. Um, unfortunately, when we say you know the amount of radiation is not that much, people think that they can irradiate any patient that walks in, and um, that is um, sometimes uh, you know when you have children, you don't want you know the children get exposed to um, too much radiation, and um, uh, in a uh, uh, Academy, American Academy of Maxillofacial Radiology, we are concerned about, um, you know, imaging gently. Um, I had a orthodontist calling me and saying, you know, I want to um, uh, take a scan on every child that gets into my office because it's easier. You can move the teeth digitally. You can uh, virtually do your treatment and show it to the parents and the, and the child. And uh, this is what I want to do. And I'm like, no, you can't do that. You have to establish a standard of care and not uh, expose every patient that walks in. And we have to be careful. I know it makes uh, our job so much easier, uh, you know, for implant surgery, for evaluation of, um, you know, ortho, perio. Uh, it's easier when you use comb beam CT data, but we have to think about our patients too. But unfortunately, um, sometimes, uh, you know, the laziness gets into, uh, into uh, practice and uh, we, we forget that our goal is to take care of a patient. And if we can take care of our patients with less radiation, um, it's going to be more helpful and uh, it's, it's better for everybody. I, I love that image gently. I wish you'd write an article on that in Dental Town. I really wish in Dental Town Magazine you'd write an article on this. So I'm going to throw the same question at you. What would you say to you if an endodontist asked you right now, commuting to work, do you think I should buy a CBCT and image every molar before I do it since the number one cause of a failed root canal is uh, missing uh, a canal? Do you think I should take a 3D image of every molar so I know all the canals before I start? Honestly, um, no, I, I, I don't recommend that uh, because there are a lot of molars that you can do, especially an endodontist. I mean, as a general dentist, I, I try that many times. And I, when I was successful in doing that, I'm sure that a, uh, uh, an endodontist would be successful. But it's where the um, uh, clinical judgment comes into place, in my opinion. You know, you can do... you know, Yes, it is easier to do that and know the canal. I have a video. I can find it if I, um, I could. Um, that you can virtually go through the canals and look at the pulp, and uh, every accessory canal is visible when you have the um, the um, digital data, and you can reconstruct everything. You can take away all the hard tissue and just look at the pulp, and um, and that's amazing. But do we want that for our patients? We are not treating just a tooth. We are treating a patient. So we have to consider that. Um, so no, I don't think every tooth needs a CT scan, but I believe that many do. So if you want to buy it and have it in your office and, you know, um, you can probably have maybe one or two cases that walk into your office that probably need the, um, the scan but not for every patient. No, I don't recommend that. Yeah, but I mean, you're you're like the only one I hear saying this. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, we need to give you a bigger platform and a bigger microphone because you know when you go to a dental convention, that's not what the CBCT guy is saying. Because they're selling the machines. I right? know. <laughs> Mon money's the answer. What's the question? I, I wish you'd write an article on that because I'll tell you what, I had a personal experience. I, I got four boys. Uh, mm -hmm. which means no matter what I do on earth, I'll get into heaven just from all that, uh, all that <laughs> trauma, pain, and suffering. And one of my boys had a bump, and we didn't know what it was, so we went down, and it was causing pain. So we went down to the emergency room, and the lady took him back and instantly took uh, uh, a CAT scan and then, uh, and, put him in, and then when the doctor got there, he said, well, why the hell did you take a CAT scan? And she goes, well, because there's a bump. He goes, you don't take a CAT scan. I was just... It's just a little fatty deal, and it, it, it's nothing. And I just thought to myself, he's a boy. 
So he had all of his testicles, everything completely irradiated. And, and, and she didn't even have a doctor's order to do it. If oh the doctor God. would have came in first, I mean, the doctor should have written the prescription to go take the CBCT. And here at the big hospital in my neighborhood, you know, mm -hmm. the, 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 whatever it was, LPN nurse, whatever, just went back there and it totally radiated him. And so is there, is there, do we have any data at all, anything we can hang our hat on that says an ink that dental x-rays have an increase of some type of cancer? Well, there was an article written a um, few um, years ago, or maybe a couple of years ago, um, and um, it was a very controversial article. And it was, I, I, I can tell you right now, it was a wrong article that um, they were correlating melanoma with, uh, with dental x-rays. And the, the, the funny thing was a... Uh, uh, a bite wing, the, the set of bite wings had more effect on the production of melanoma than uh, the entire um, FMX, which doesn't make sense. And it was approved by um, some organizations and uh, they, they put it in the newspaper. Um, they say there is correlate, there is a correlation, but it's not, um, it, it's not, uh, it's not proven yet. But the thing is, radiation is harmful no matter what. That we, that's that's what we know. So why we expose the patients um, in something that it's it's going to be harmful eventually? It is you know, it is radiation. Even you you go in the sun. I had a one time I told my patients that um, uh, she came in for she had a, a big abscess. This is when I was at um, I was doing my um, uh, rotation as a dental student and. Um, uh, she came in and she said, uh, you know, I have this and we, we took an x-ray. We wanted to take an x-ray. She said, no, I don't want x-ray because it has radiation. She had a radiation phobia. And I told her, you know, walking to your car in San Antonio, Texas, you're going to get more radiation than, uh, you know, just, just one PA that I want to take for, you know, to evaluate the um, apex of, of the tooth. And she said, no, I I'm, I don't want to agree on that and I'm going to leave. So she was leaving and she came back and said, uh, can I get your lead apron to go to my car? I'm like, oh, I, I, I create a monster now. So, um, you know, you get radiation and radiation is harmful, but the amount of radiation that um, we um, get, give our patients for diagnosis, um, it's worth if we decide that it is worth it. But not every patient needs that amount of radiation Dental um, x-rays such as panoramic and, and uh, FMX and, and uh, white wings, they don't have that much air like at the bottom of the, um, the uh, curve. If you look at it, they have the least amount of radiation. Do it's you negligible. Have, do, you, do you have a chart comparing PA, uh, I can FMX, CVCT that you could email me? Or, or could you I do, them? I do. Could, could, on, on Dental Town, uh -huh. uh, we have... Um, um, I wish you would post that on Dental Town. So we have um, 50 categories, and the um, one of the categories here. Let me go to categories. They're alphabetic order: anesthesia, assistance, CAD CAM. Uh, one of them is um, um, oral and maxillofacial radiology, imaging, okay. and photography. And I wish it would be it would add so much credibility to our site. So the, the subcategories are cone beam CT imaging, digital radiography, film radiology, intro cameras, photography, radiographic diagnosis, and transmitting demo, digital images to payers and providers. But I wish you would do that because I'm going to ask you another question. You, you said that patient, you created a monster. She wanted to borrow your lead apron. <laughs> Don't you think there's been a decrease in uh, the use of thyroid collars? Um, uh Lately? Yes, yes, but um, the, the new recommendation is you have to have them. Um, but the problem is because of the amount of radiation, and we know it's negligible, that's why people just neglect to do that. Um, but it is recommended, so we have to use it. I don't know how it's in Arizona, but in Texas it is recommended. We have to use it. Well, in Texas, they just got rid of your specialty. You became a specialist. And the Texas yes. courts with that implantology case. So, so, so <laughs> Tara, you're not even a specialist anymore. What do you What do you think about that in Texas? Well, I'm a specialist in maxillofacial radiology. So, <laughs> but you you know the lawsuit I'm talking to, right? 
No, no, I haven't heard that one now. Oh, oh anyway, I'm there, sorry. There, there was a uh, the Texas. Uh, I have the, to look into that. <laughs> the, the Texas State Dental Association, the, the, uh -huh. the tripartite system yeah. of the American Dental Association, mm -hmm. um, um, told a general dentist who was advertising that he was a specialist in implantology to quit saying that because it was not a specialty. So it went to court, and the court ruled that the American Dental Association is just a membership organization, and they have no jurisdiction and this man in fact only did implants and it was not false in this meeting advertising and mm -hmm. uh said that um and especially only applies to your membership organization it doesn't um it doesn't apply to the consumer market and so actually you are a specialist in oral maxillofacial surgery you can say that but uh -huh. if someone else but anyway it's it's a crazy deal but it's there's a long argument. yeah here here in texas we are very conservative and <laughs> you're very what we are very conservative about things, so. <laughs> no, te Texas is probably one of the most anti-government states out there. I mean, they, they still refer to them the Lone Star State. I have dentist friends who think Texas should secede from the union, and I'm, I'm not making this up. I'm moving to California then. <laughs> 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 no, and it, and it might be it might be part of the formula of America's success is that all the people are so cynical about government to begin with. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in the Middle East, it's even worse, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, so um, I'm going to ask you, what is your, what percent of the 150,000 general dentists and 30,000 specialists in the United States do you think appropriately use a thyroid collar? I would say probably 35%. This is not, don't quote me anywhere because it's not yeah. based on any, any, um, any I research. Agree. I um, but not and, not everybody. And what percent do you think take too many X-rays? Probably seventy-five. Exactly. And and how much can you to my most people are listening to this as they're commuting to work. Can you is it, is there any simple way to explain the difference amount of radiation between uh, a PA bite wings, an FMX, a pano, and a CVCT? Is there any way for you to orally describe um, that? So if we give a scale of, for example, a um, white wing, if the white wing is um, about 20, then the FMX is, I would say, 50 a scale. And then the cone beam CT is probably 250. And then... Uh, medical CT is 2,500. So, and, uh, you know, depending on the machine that you use for cone beam CT, depending on, um, you know, the, the field of view, uh, it's going to be a different amount of radiation. And, um, you know, so it's, it's all the uh, on discretion of the doctor. For example, I got um, an orthodontist calling me the other night, and there was a two impacted canines. Um, one, I had maybe one third of the canine number 11, but she sent it for evaluation of the impacted canine. They got number six, the entire number six, but they, she put it in a small volume. And now she has to, she has to send the patient again to the same imaging center to get from the other side. So, um, for example, if you want to do ortho and you think that there is you know, to impact the teeth. Maybe I don't know what happened in the mandible. This is in the maxilla. So it's better to take a large volume and give the patient a little bit more radiation rather than taking the patient four times for, you know, it's four times the radiation. So um, I think we should, in, instead of just, you know, saying, okay, go take an FMX or take a PA or whatever, we should um, kind of direct our, uh, our assistants to, um, to gear the information, or to, to um, encourage them to, uh, or order them uh, to take an uh, evaluation that it's beneficial for the patient. In this, in this case, I told her, why didn't you have like a larger um, uh, volume rather than, you know, she wanted to protect the patient, and I understand that, but thinking beforehand, so you have to have your treatment plan before sending the patient to the, uh, to the scanning center. This is my point. So you cannot just send everybody and say, okay, take a take a volume of the entire head or, you know, a small volume. And now, oh, okay, I have to deal with number 11 now. So go take another scan. 
So it's better to do the treatment planning before sending the patient for extra imaging. And, you know, I've, I worked in a dental office for a little while. And every patient who walked in, before even the doctor would have seen the, the patient, they would have taken, a, depending on how much the insurance is paying, um, you know, they had the uh, PAs done, they had the uh, FMX done or panoramic done. I think the doctor should see the patient and see what the needs are, look at the chart and see, okay, the patient had an a, FMX done two years ago and there was nothing wrong with the patient, so why do we have to do it again? Even if the... the, the um, the insurance is paying. I know we have a lot of loans to pay. We have a lot of, you know, they want to buy that extra boat or whatever. But um, I think we are here to take care of our patients. And uh, this is our main, main job to take care of a patient. And, um, you know, yeah, we have to um, realize that this is our, 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 our job, not to just, you know, have the, the x-ray taken like your son, you know. He went in, probably your insurance was good, and they say, okay, let's take a scan on this kid. And uh, why? Let's do- let the doctor come here and let him decide what he wants to do, and, and then we go from That's why we are there. Otherwise, you know, they probably could have a machine do that, you know, the broken bone. Okay, this is what the prescription is. That's why the doctors are uh, in the office to see the patients. Um, what, what percent of doctors do you think see the new patient and then order their x-rays versus they walk in there, see them, the dental assistant takes all the x-rays, and then the doctor comes in. Maybe 10%. I know, and it's not even legal. <laughs> and and you, you see all these practice management people who are not doctors. They didn't go to dental school. They, they, they don't have any initials behind their name. And they write these articles uh, in journals that say things like, um, well, how many opportunities do we have? They, who's due for their FMX? And then they check off, oh, here's... Three of our nine patients, they are due for an FMX. Let's get that FMX because that'll be an extra $100 or whatever. And it's like, well, by God, the, shouldn't the, the, the carries, uh, state of carries, determine whether you need an FMX? I mean, uh, I, and, and what's funny is you look at this six-month recall, but all my dentist friends that I know, mm-hmm. I mean, every dentist I know doesn't get their teeth clean every six months. They get them clean every nine months, 10 months, 12 months, and they'll get x-rays every maybe one tooth or bite wings every four or five years. And then their own office, everybody marched in, just gets an FMX. If the insurance pays every three, they do it every three. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not right. Sometimes, sometimes we forget why we are uh, where we are. That's, that's the problem. And um, that is why I'm in an admission committee at the University of Texas um, uh, for dental students, because we want people who come here to have a passion about taking care of the patients. Um, and it's, it's funny that, I'm sorry. No, that's me um, calling you. That was me. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, you know, uh, sometimes they even have the, uh, the nurse to tell me, you know, I'm interviewing them and they say, oh, um, I wanted to be a doctor, but you know, you can get paid better when you're a dentist. I'm like, okay, we are not gonna have, you know, <laughs> If it's just just for the uh, the money that you can make, um, I mean, it's the money is good. You never see like a dentist begging in the uh, 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 in the street. But um, I mean, if you want to make money, I think you should go to real estate. This is what my recommendation is. Oh, um, no, you are a doctor it, because you, you want you to. Can, you can you can marry more money in a minute than you can earn in a lifetime. <laughs> That's true. That's I say, true. I say, if you want to be a millionaire, just just find that eighty year old lady who's worth ten million dollars. Her That's husband right. died twenty years ago. Just find that lady. Um, so, um, we both we both agree that X rays are um, are taken ninety percent of the time before a doctor's diagnosed. We we both agree that if you say that every new patient gets an FMX or you say every new orthodontic start gets a CBCT and that every molar endo at an endodontist gets a CBCT, that that's, that's just not right. That is not right. You have to have a, a you need treatment to plan. That article because the, the noise of the industry is everybody selling a CBCT. You know, they go to these magazines, they say, well, you know, not, not my magazine, but they go to some magazine. They say, you print this article and we'll buy a full page ad next to it. And they buy these big booths at the conventions. They got all these salespeople and blah, 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 blah. And so you're saying the worst message because 
There's no money involved. In fact, if I listen to you, I make less money. Who the hell is going to promote that? I'll promote the shit out of it on Dentaltown. <laughs> right, 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 right. 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 Article. Uh, I, uh, I like that. I had never heard of that before. Um, um, imaging image gently. That is, yes. uh, and then the other thing I gotta, I gotta, um, I know my dentist. I do. I mean, I know them so well. A lot of them are just technology. They just love technology, whether it's their iPhone, their iPad, they just love it all. So the CBCT is like kind of buying a Ferrari, a boat and a girlfriend all wrapped up into mm-hmm. one. And they, they love that thing. Um, and now uh, 3D imaging is getting connected to 3D printing, right? Yes, yes, it Talk is. Talk about that. What, how, what, how's that coming along? Tell us about all that. Well, when, uh, the, the case that they have, it's it's showing that too. So you can buy a machine and just do everything. You can even fabricate your own uh, surgical guide using this. Um, you know, it's it's a trend. And um, if you have the extra money and, um, and you know, you fad. Yes. Yes. No. No. I mean, go, go, okay. go, go. Go to University of Texas. Go. Go to the, all those. Uh, go to. Go to the. Find any. Find any oral surgeon or periodontist in Texas that's placed five thousand implants or more. They've never used a surgical guide. It's because they're surgeons. It's because when they lay the tissue back and they see a second bicuspid and a second molar, they're pretty damn sure the implant goes in between it from a mesial distal, and they're going to split the buccal lingual in half. I don't know anybody who's placed 5,000 implants in their life who would even recommend a surgical guide. But I know it's a huge fad in dentistry. It is. Um, and the thing is, sometimes you, I mean, the, the, I am a maxillofacial radiologist and I see a lot of cases that uh, confident people, you know, sometimes we get overconfident and then uh, you come up with a lot of uh, disastrous cases that um, we see. I, 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 I can tell you once a week I have a case that that happened, you know, um, the they didn't guide. without the surgical guide. Oh, yeah. so you're, they're so, they're you're so saying, confident. So, oh, oh, you mean they're so confident without a surgical guide? Yes. So, and, and they you're, mess so it you're up. Saying, <laughs> you're saying from what you see once a week that you recommend a surgical guide. I do. I do. I do. Honestly, because, yes. Because, because I'm 54. Every one of my friends at 60 to 75 that's placed five to 10,000, he goes, yeah, yeah, why don't you get a surgical guide and put training wheels on your bicycle? <laughs> Grow up. Learn how to be a surgeon. Take the training wheels off. This is, the, this is the same approach as the cone beam CT. Uh, not every case that comes into your office needs a surgical guide, but there are cases that really do. This okay, is, what about this- replacing a... Si- when you look at the 32 teeth from the hundreds of millions of claims by the insurance sales, there's mm-hmm. only four spikes and it's the six-year molars. That's the tooth, most root canal, most extracted, most bridge, most... In- so you go along, you know, one, two, three, four, five, boom. Then it's seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and then when you get to 14, boom. So, so for just missing a first molar, which is the most common tooth to be replaced with an implant, a bridge, a root canal, would you recommend a surgical guide for that? Uh, probably not for just single implant, but I would recommend taking a scan to see if there is a um, maybe um, a undercut. Um, you know, if, if you touch it and you don't feel the bone all the way, probably you need the cone beam CT and probably for one single implant, no. Um, but even with that, sometimes you have, you know, a very thin um, uh in buckle plate that you want to avoid uh, perforating. So in that case, like for anterior teeth, like for eight to nine, I definitely recommend it because half a millimeter could save um, a tooth. Well, so, number one, number one. Uh, <laughs> let's be clear, eight and nine. You refer that case to whoever you hate the most. Find find, <laughs> find the periodontist because especially now, if it was a seventy-year-old man with a liver spot, you can do eight or nine. But if it's a woman mm-hmm. under age 100, you mm-hmm. do not, you're do you married to that case until it looks pretty. That's right. And, and a lot of times those cases don't turn out pretty. And I, 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 I just don't think you make, I don't think you make any money replacing incisors with implants on women. And, and <laughs> I, I, I mean, you don't because... Yes, yeah, you're right. <laughs> a success, a success, like like me. I'm 54. I'm fat. I'm bald. I, I I don't show any of my teeth. I look like I'm talking without my upper denture in. 
you know, I mean, all, all that tooth has to do is work. But if it was in a woman, she'd stretch her lip back over her head. <laughs> and if she could see anything wrong with it, she's going to be right, right back at your front desk. So, so number one, you got to mm -hmm. pick profitable cases. And That's incisors right. on women are not profitable cases. That's what, you know, and then if you got some periodontist or oral surgeon that you hate, send them there. Or, yes. or a prostate. <laughs> okay. But uh, for those, I definitely recommend surgical guides. I have a case I want to show you. Let me see if I can I can show this. This is an hey, exciting. You told me you had a hundred cases to show me. I do, but this one I opened it here just for you. It's a particular <laughs> for you. <laughs> All right. Okay. This is a case that um, I wanted to share with you. We had a 65 year old male. Um, with uh, a lot of problems, dental problems, attrition, several res uh, restorations, several missing dentition. And this is a uh, uh, pre-op digital impression. Um, and then we made a, a model, a digital model. Uh, we actually made a model from the digital scan and the uh, OVD was established like that. Then you can put markers on the model and since you need a certain amount of uh, space to put your implant and, the, and restoration, you can mark the model. And then you can make a, a digital model uh, with alignment markers. And uh, this, this is uh, from, the, from the model. Then uh, you establish the OVD. So this is the mark that you put and you have to have reduction of bone on this. For these cases, you definitely need surgical guides. Um, so um, you mark that and then mount it and you reduce the amount of bone um, on the model and then take another, uh, uh, you dig digitize that. This is after the bone reduction. And then you um, uh, set the teeth, the mandibular teeth, uh, which is opposing to the natural patient's teeth. You get a white registration and you index the uh, cross-mounted incisal edge and position the, uh, the uh, maxillary uh, wax up as well. Go this way. All right. And you can take a scan of, of the entire wax up from the mandible and the maxilla. Then you can, uh, these are the, uh, this is the, um, the patient, the actual patient's uh, 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 scan. And this is the, the bone that is reduced, and this is the digitized bone reduction with the wax up. So you have all of these information and you can superimpose them with these markers that you put at the beginning. And then uh, we can um, print a model and uh, uh, mount it into the existing opposing teeth and get the bite registration with the bite registration that we had initially. And then you can uh, remove the tooth mounting jig and this is the amount of bone that uh, can be reduced. And this is how it, um, you can look at the articulation with the um, maxillary teeth. Then you choose your correct analog and position it into the uh, slots that you want. And then put your abutment in there. And this is how they orient when you um, um, look at it on the, on the, act, on the uh, sagittal view. Uh, then you protect the screws on the abutment um, uh, before processing. This is the actual dentures. Um, and then you have the um, bite registration between the, um, the maxillary natural dentitions and the mandibular um, uh, dentures. And you fill the uh, intaglio area with the PVC. Um, so this is how it's gonna look, the mandibular teeth with the bite registration and the, um, and the uh, maxillary natural teeth. Then you prepare the denture for surgical conversion. So you make the drill holes on the dentures and get it ready. And um, create a bone to denture transfer jig by putting like a, a heavy body uh, PVC between the denture and the, um, and, and the, the uh, reduced bone. Uh, and this is how uh, we can put the temporary abutment and adjust the denture um, for access. So this is all done before even you see the, I mean, before you start the surgery. So everything is ready. This, this saves a lot of, the, lot of time um, for patients and for the, for the doctor. Uh, this covers the bone and, and, uh, and the, uh, the uh, uh, implants are coming out of it. 
And um, this is what is shipped uh, ready for shipment. You have the uh, upper denture, you have the lower denture with, with the bite registration and um, we can make your, uh... okay, this is how the 360 imaging has its own software for implant uh, uh, treatment planning. And um, this is the abundant, uh, the, the actual, uh, uh, the actual um, implant. And this is the amount of bone that we have to reduce in order to uh, establish uh, enough space for rest uh, restoration. You can change the angulation of the, um, uh, the implant. And then this is how it's going to look when it, it's finished. And um, this is superimposition on all of those components that I showed you a few slides ago, like here. This is superimposition of all of those uh, data. Um, sorry, I gotta go this way. Um, this is where the implants are gonna go, and these are the fixation screws, and uh, this is the actual patient's bone with the reduction and everything. Um, and this is an, an axial view uh, of the uh, patient when it's done. So you have the bone and you have the denture. This is where the implants, the four implants are gonna go. And these are the fixation um, uh, pins to, uh, to hold all of these together. This is when surgery is done and everything is perfect and uh, we can, this is all done virtually. Um, so you do your surgery even before um, uh, putting the, um, the patient in the chair. This is a uh, case that um, we did with Dr. Cohen. He's a periodontist and he sent the patient for the uh, scan and everything. And uh, the actual- first name? Was it Michael? William, William Cohen. In his, Seattle? No, that's Michael Cohen. Uh, yes, no, uh, this, uh, no, he's from uh, uh, um, San Luis. He's from San Luis, I think. Um, so these are the steps that um, uh, we go, uh, or the, the surgeon goes through. This is the uh, extracted teeth, the, the, the flap is, is made, and um, this is the uh, seat reduction uh, uh, guide and the vertical mount guide. Uh, this one, when the vertical mount guide is removed and then the, um, the bone is reduced, and then you can put the, um, the surgical guide on the top and then start drilling. I'm gonna show you step by step. This is after extraction, the flap is made. This is the um, bone reduction guide. You put that on the, on the patient and then screw it and um, keep it uh, or make it uh, stable. This is the vertical mount to, uh, so we know how much of the bone reduction is gonna, is gonna um, be done. Uh, bone reduction guide with vertical mount. Um, this is the screw that's a 3D connection pin that um, uh, put everything together and keeps everything stable during the surgery. This is the reduced uh, bone. So at this point, the bone reduction uh, a uh, guide is uh, is uh, is in place and is stable, and then um, uh, we um, uh, we take away the uh, uh, vertical mount guide, and this is the surgical uh, guide that we put in for for surgery. All right. Um, when sometimes you have to do a lot of reduction, then the uh, the height of bone in the anterior and posterior um, aspect of the mandible or maxilla is going to be a lot. There is going to be a lot of difference, so we don't want extra tissue. What we do is we reduce this area a little bit too. So, uh, or the surgeon does it, not us, the surgeon. Um, uh, so um, there is not much of a, a tissue, extra tissue hanging in there. Um, this is the articulation piece, um, and this is the analog model of an articulation. Um, this is the the um, it shows the anatomy of the patient um, as they uh, show up in the in the in the um, oral surgery um, suite. Um, this is a collaboration between Dr. William Cohen and, and Barry Goldberg. Um, uh, Dr. Goldberg was the, the surgeon in this case. And look at this patient's smile. You know, um, he is a smiling. He's a happy guy, but um, you know, the smile is a little bit reserved. This is a close-up of it. Um, so this is after extraction and a flap. 
the um, the um, so, uh, the uh, bone reduction guide and the vertical mount guide is in place in here, and the screw is um, putting it together. They articulate together. Uh, the um, vertical um, guide, a bone guide, is removed, and you have the um, the uh, reduction guide in place. So we reduce this amount of bone like that, and then the surgical guide is in place now with the screws all fixed, so nothing changes. And you go in and put your denture seat. Um, that we put the um, temporary denture that is going to articulate using the um, bite registration with the opposing teeth. And um, now we're going to work on the maxilla. We put the um, bone reduction guide in the maxilla. Now we don't need the um, the vertical mount guide and this uh, upper uh, implants. Uh, we do the bone reduction, place the surgical guide in there, put four implants in the maxilla, and these are the implants. I don't know if you can see it here. These are the implants. On this side, it's not visible that much. But um, And then we suture it, deliver the maxillary um, dentures, and this is the temporary. So the patient leaves the office just like that. And um, this surgery doesn't take more than an hour and a half. Um, and this is how the patient looks like. Okay. This is how the patient looks like now. I know we don't have that much time, but I want to show you something. Can I show you or, something? What do you really don't have much time? It's Friday. You're, I know. Uh, I, I'm, it, you're, it's 2 p.m. on a Friday. It's all right, so you have all night. Weekend. <laughs> I, would, I would listen to you for 40 days and 40 nights. By the way, if you're listening to this on iTunes, this is one of those cases you're going to want to watch on uh, Dental Town YouTube or Facebook uh, because these are amazing cases. And by the way, man, I wish you would start posting cases like this on Dental Town. Tara, these are amazing. Yes. But yeah, I, I take agree. all the time you want. Show me all the cases you want to show me. Okay. All right. I have another case that I, it, it really, um, this is uh, what really made me a love pathology. Uh, not because, you know, I, I like to people to get sick, but um, my daughter was 15 when I saw this case and it really touched me. This is a case of a 15 year old female. And, um, let me go from the top and I show you what's happening here. This is a 15 year old female and my daughter was at the same um, age. This is um, an orthodontist who finished uh, the ortho treatment and uh, on the uh, panoramic image that he took after finishing the treatment, he noticed something on the, um, on the right side of the patient maxillary right side. And uh, he wasn't sure so he, he took in a, a scan and sent it to me. When I saw this case, um, I was really, really, um, um, I, it, I couldn't sleep that night, honestly. Um, yeah, somebody told me uh, when I saw this case, I, I went to bed and I slept like a baby. That means I woke up every two hours and cried. So um, that's exactly what happened. I was really um, uh, touched by this case. Um, as you can see here, there is a large... Uh, soft tissue, um, there is a large soft tissue mass on the, on the uh, right maxilla. Let me just draw a panoramic image because we all love to look at the panoramic. Do you see there is a large radiolucency right here? This is a, a panoramic reconstruction from the cone beam CT. And uh, there is a severe root resorption in the area of three, four, five. And uh, when you look through the slices, you can see there is an interruption of the floor of the, let me make this bigger, uh, floor of the nasal cavity, uh, floor of the, um, uh, floor of the uh, uh, right maxillary sinus, severe root resorption. And uh, this only happens in, you know, severe root resorption with no uh, uh, movement of the teeth. I mean, I was devastated, you know, this kid, uh, at this age, it, it's a malignant, uh, probably malignant tumor. And um, I sent it to the doctor and um, I sent the report and I, I said, this is a malignancy. We have to do um, uh, advanced imaging and uh, uh, later, 
But for now, let's do biopsy in that area to see what's going on. And we do it right away. So, I mean, we need it to be um, an emergency. Um, so, and the, and the poor orthodontist uh, sent me uh, um, a prior, uh, you know, the uh, extra prior to treatment. And you could hardly see it at the beginning uh, of the treatment. So you, it was um, just a small little um, radiolucency that it was not even um, very uh, obvious in the panel. Um, so uh, when we, uh, we, I looked at the, uh, uh, you know, the, the patient had uh, several panoramic, it gotten bigger and bigger. Um, and then I realized this patient had ortho. So there was uh, braces. Um, so be because of the presence of the uh, braces, his teeth could not move. And um, the biopsy result came back as a um, uh, central giant cell granuloma. And if you look into any type of literature review, any book for central giant uh, cell granuloma, uh, first of all, it's multilocular. This one is a large ma uh, mass without any loculation. Uh, it passes the midline. And uh, this one stopped right at the midline. Uh, it's uh, the more uh, aggressive types, they have root resorption, but not this extensive. And they hardly have um, a lot of bone resorption, as we can see here. So uh, uh, Dr. Langley, who is my, my mentor and taught me radiology, he always said, uh, lesions don't, or pathology never reads books. So <laughs> I think that was one of the, I'm, I'm glad that this patient does not have a malignant tumor, um, but you know, she basically lost uh, one fourth of her, of her mouth, but, um, but it's fortunate that it's not malignant. So she doesn't have to do, to go through um, radiation and, and, and chemotherapy, but um, you know, it looked really scary and I couldn't sleep at night because you know, my daughter was the same age and I mean, even if it wasn't, you know, um, the similarity that I could feel, you know, still, you know, when the patients have things like that, it's just heartbreaking. Um, uh, but, um, you know, I don't want to scare people, uh, but if you see even the smallest thing, especially in ortho, um, you know, you have to pay attention. And if you see it's getting uh, more and more, maybe we should have, this is when we need comb beam CT. And this is, uh, I stand by it. Um, and I can go to any court and say, you know, um, uh, we need this cone beam CT. But everybody who walks in does not need cone beam CT, in my opinion. Um, so, yeah, this, this was an uh, interesting case that doesn't match any, any textbook uh, description of this lesion. Um, so, um, well, did I scare you too much? No, I'm loving it. <laughs> I'm loving it. All right, so yeah, this is this is a case that um, uh, kind of bugged me for a while, but um, after I found out that the patient um, did not have cancer, but it has the appearance, you know, the the um, uh, behavior of this uh, pathology, uh, it, it looks really um, uh, malignant. But thank God it was not malignant, and you know we have to consider the presence of the. Um, um, the braces because the, the, the teeth could not go anywhere so they start absorbing but if braces were not there um, it would have probably a lot of uh, uh, displacement um, that and that's why um, you know we say the pathology doesn't read books so <laughs> um, this is a very interesting case and always dear to my heart but the patient did okay. They they planning on putting implants later on, but uh, for now she's very um, enters. Do you have any questions? Well, I um, well, I, I did have questions on. Um, um, well, well, first of all, you you are also the um, oral and maxillofacial uh, surge uh, radiologist for 360 Imaging out of uh, Georgia. <laughs> Uh, yes. Explain um, what that company is and what, what they do and what you do for them. Um, I am their uh, maxillofacial radiologist. I'm on board. I work uh, uh, five days with, uh, with 360 Imaging. And um, what I do is I look at uh, mostly all of the scans. We have trained uh, uh, treatment planners. Some of them are dentists. And uh, what they do is 
any case that comes in, they look at it. And if they see something that's out of ordinary, um, they call me and send the, um, uh, the scans to me. I mean, I get all of the scans. So they tell me, okay, look at this and see what you think. Um, and if there is anything going on, I, um, um, uh, I just let them know and I add a radiology report. Um, I do uh, between 15 to 20 cases a day for them, um, for the people that they request radiology report. But um, any other cases that we see anything out of ordinary, we, we let the doctor know that we see a pathology. And that happens several times. I've been working um, with um, 360 imaging for the last, um, uh, it's more than nine years, almost 10 years now. And uh, we had several cases that the patient was sent. Like I have another case I can show you really quick. Um, yeah, this one. Um, this one um, was a case that, um, uh, it was just an implant implant case. And I look at it and um, I saw some, hold on, let me, just a second. Um, so I look at everything and um, what 360 imaging does, we have imaging centers that we can take scans on the patient. Um, and from that time on until the implant is placed into the patient's mouth, we have services surgical guides, 3D printing, we do all of that services uh, in, in, uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. So the timing is awesome. Uh, you know, people used to send their scans to Belgium to, you know, make surgical guides. This is happening um, in between, I mean, if, if it's a rush case, we can do it in 48 hours. Uh, so it's faster. Um, uh, I'm available all the time. I have people uh, from California calling me. I have people from New York calling me. Um, you know, if there is something emergency, you know, at you know six o'clock uh, California time, uh, you know, the, the doctor is doing a extraction and a uh, root tip is in the sinus. They send it and I look at it. Um, I work from home most of the time. I go to school two half days. Um, I'm a part-timer at, at uh, University of Texas. Um, and if there's an emergency, I'm always available. So we give that service. Um, you know, that happened a few times. Um, and uh, we, can, we can make anything. We can even treatment plan it. Um, and then after treatment plan, we call the doctor and go over the, um, um, go over the treatment planning. And the doctor decides if he wants to go with the treatment plan that we propose. Uh, or he want to have it, uh, you know, a little bit of change here and there. Um, we we do that, and then we we do uh, we fabricate our um, uh, own surgical guides. On on your website, it's uh, 360 imagingcom I love. You have two testimonials, and one of them is from uh, Dr. Robert Bruce McDonald, DDS, and uh, this is so funny because we I just said this earlier in the podcast. He says, and I quote, "It's funny. My CAD designer and I at 360 Imaging lecture about." digital design workflow and guided surgery all the time. The young docs nod their head, they get it. The older docs shake their head and say, I've been putting them in for years with no stinking guides and I ain't gonna start using them now. Mm -hmm. I think it's almost a generational thing. In the lab side of our business, we try to make miracles out of poorly placed implants every day. We may just have to win this battle through attrition. I truly appreciate all the work you guys do since we have been doing all guided surgery placements that has made my life as a dentist and as a lab owner a lot easier. That's uh, that's pretty amazing. So you mm -hmm. guys, uh, you, you guys are, are huge in this space. Um, you've done, um, my gosh, you've done 200,000 guided implants in 75,000 dental offices. I mean, holy moly, that's a lot. <laughs> so as an oral and maxillofacial radiologist, uh, and back to the uh, question on guided surgeries, what, you, how often are you seeing a mistake, an implant place, a mistake, a disaster, uh, and, and what are lessons learned that you can transfer to everyone listening to you right now from the oral and maxilloradiologist point of view on implant placement? Well, um, as I said before, every case is different. Some cases are easy and you can put an implant in, you know, in a space that's available with no problem. Um, we are the doctors or the, 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 the people who see the patients have to take control of the treatment plan. Uh, if there is an area that you are not sure about it, it's better to put a, um, 
a surgical guide and you and go through all of the steps of uh, perfect treatment planning beforehand. Um, how many times have you done something and you said, if I, I, I do it again, I do a better job? It's the same thing. You do the exact surgery digitally without harming anybody prior to doing the actual surgery. So, I mean, if it was me, I'd rather do it in a shorter amount of time. It saved me time save me money because if I save time, I don't have to, you know, pay my assistant for another extra hour that I'm going to, you know, uh, uh, struggle with, the, with an implant. Okay, I put it buccally, lingually, where should I put it? What is the angulation? What the outcome is going to come? When you have a, um, a, a surgical guide, you know this beforehand. You even have the restoration plan beforehand. So everything is done. There is no, I'm not saying there is a no mistake, but there is a very small chance of a mistake. And honestly, every week probably I have one or two um, cases that are done and now the implants are failing or there is, the, the, uh, I've seen implants that are out of the um, alveolar bone, sometimes in, in even soft tissue. Um, you know, the, the angulation of the alveolar bone sometimes does not, um, is not enough for, for an implant, and you uh, go with the contour of the teeth that are, you know, erupted, and then you miss it and you, you perforate through the lingual or even buccal uh, plate. So um, in my opinion, I mean, if you can do something better, faster, save time for yourself and money, uh, why not use it, you know? How much is the um, surgical guide, 250 extra? Um, if it's gonna save you a big lawsuit, I, I think it's it's a wise thing to do, and um, you know since we're looking at every scans, I mean it's it's safer to have you know, another set of eyes look at it, and um, even if you know um, even if it's a simple case, if you're not sure, if you're 100 percent sure, that's fine. Go ahead and do it, and I've I've seen a lot of successful implants without without. Um, uh, the surgical guide, but those are mostly single implants. But even if, if you have a um, single implant, but you're not sure about it, um, I would I would recommend surgical guide. It, it's a, it's saving time. And which, um, which, which CBCTs do you do you like the most? Oh, uh, that's a good. That's a hundred. What do they call it? The one million quest, one million dollar question. Um, depending on what you're doing, um, like you know. If molar you want, endo. if you're an endodontist doing molar endo, I don't want to sound like a salesman or saleswoman. <laughs> um, for endo, the um, you know, uh, CareStream has a good good machine with a uh, reasonable price. Morita has a good machine. Um, these are the scans that I've seen, and um, uh, when you transfer the data to another, you know, sometimes you know some scans are really good. Um, when you look at it on their um, on their own software, and then when you transfer it to another software, they look bad. Um, and when you want to do implant uh, planning on those, that's not going to work. But Morita and and um, uh, and um, what uh, what not model number on the care stream in the J Morita? Oh gosh, um, then I'm going to really really sound like a uh, saleswoman. No, no, um, no. You, you, depending you, on you see there is scans from uh, everyone. I don't know the exact name of them. Uh, there, there are several, but uh, Morita, I mean, their machine is really, it's its a little bit of a pricey, uh, uh, on a pricey scale, but um, if you want to do endo, they, uh, their resolution is awesome. And they have their own software that comes with it. Um, and even if you transfer it to another software, it, it looks good, so. What, what about uh, ortho, where you need you know, both jaws and, and a cell? And a um, the iCat. The you iCat, like the iCat the best? Yes. I, now, I now mean, which one did Invisalign buy? I, iCat or iTero? iTero, I believe. I'm not sure. I'm not into companies. I try not to well, I mean, yeah, but <laughs> endorse I, I any. Know, I know, but, they're, but my homies. They're all want, good. The, my homies want to know because, because you're seeing scans from everybody. So mm -hmm. what if you were just, what if you're an implantologist? What if you place implants a lot? You're an oral surgeon, a periodontist. You place a lot of implants. Which system would you like? I like iCat and, and CareStream. I mean, they're, they're, all of them are basically similar. Um, but, you know, the ones that I, I see the most, um, you know, they're, they're all good. But there are some that um, they are, like, as I said, like uh, Morita is, uh, 
uh, gives more resolution. And for Endo, that looks really good. Uh, but there are some features on Kodak that you, you can, you know, get a smaller volume and get the same amount Kodak. of Kodak? You're giving away your age. Kerstream is known by Kodak. I mean, that's, no, 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 sorry. <laughs> I don't want to give my age. <laughs> No, yeah, but Kodak, Kodak sold that to CareStream, right? Yes, yes, I know. I used to call yeah. it Kodak. <laughs> and then I, and then for you guys driving that can't take notes, I like to, um, I just retweeted uh, at 360imaging.com so you can find that website. So if you can follow me on Twitter, at Howard Ferran, I, my last retweet was at 360imaging.com. Uh, um, so, um I mean, obviously, uh, that company's got to be very good if they were able to attract, retain, and keep you on board for a decade. <laughs> you must really like 360 Imaging. I do. I do. It's, it's like a family to me now. After 10 years, um, uh, Mr. Palmer um, interviewed me while I was still a resident, and uh, um, we got that connection, and uh, you know, we are just like family. So. Um, uh, I'm I'm happy. That's why I'm there, and uh, looks like they're happy. <laughs> well, I think the best marketing you could do for them is uh, start posting a bunch of cases on Dentaltown. Um, all right, we'll or, we'll do or, that. Or you could make uh, um, see some people post cases under oral radiology. Some people um, you might want to create a uh, an online CE course. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a podcast, or you could or you could write an article uh, for Dentaltown, but I, I wish you'd do all the above because um, one of the problems I see in the field is uh, they'll make a big investment in a CBCT, and they they mm -hmm. spend a hundred grand buying it, and then they 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 need more hours and hours of endless training. I almost say a CBCT and a CAD CAM is like buying a grand piano. Just because you buy a grand piano, you can't you're not Beethoven. And, That's right. <laughs> and once you buy that CBCT, I mean, even years after you've had one and thousands of scans later, you still see stuff on there every day. They have no idea what it is. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with those, those, you know, so there's an art and a science. And just because you buy a CBCT doesn't mean you're an oral and maxillofacial radiologist. Yes. And if, I mean, I heard people saying, oh, I'll, I'll take a course and, uh, uh, you know, I can, I can read my, my scans. Um, I mean, it's good that you can, when you take a course, the, the, the idea of taking a course and looking at this is so you can recognize something is out of ordinary. Um, now, you know. another, another thing I think we could do, you know, we have a continued education division because we have that yearly townie meeting every year mm -hmm. in, um, um, in April. In the first 15 years, it was in uh, Vegas, and now we're switching the format to Orlando. So we signed up the next two years, we'll be in Orlando. But the rest of the year, um, we put on courses. Um, we've, we put on pediatric dentistry courses, but um, putting on a course, um, reading CBCTs, I don't know how big a class size you would, um, um, how many students you would want. I don't know your honorarium or that, but I know this. We could sell out every single course. I mean, you could do literally one a month. You could do, you could do one a month. You, you email me, Howard at Dentaltown, and say, if you want to give courses on reading CBCTs, whether mm -hmm. you want them to fly to you or you want to go on the road or do it at 360 Imaging in Atlanta, Georgia, I know this. I know my homies, and there's thousands and thousands of dentists who made this huge investment in CBCT, and they're on Dentaltown crying, I can't read these damn things. All uh, right. I, need, I need more training. Because they're also emailing me all the time for what they want Dentaltown to do for them. And I get a gazillion requests that they want online courses on how to read these CBCTs. And I know they want um, in the flesh, hands-on, where they can bring CBCTs and go over them with you or show them. But if you ever put together a, a, a model, you know, is this mm -hmm. something you'd only want five students, 10, 20? I, I, doubt, I doubt you could put 100 in a room doing that. I don't know. But it just, just thoughts. Okay. I'm just thinking out loud with you. Um, I was so honored. Uh, that I got you on the show. I mean, you've probably read more scans than anybody I know for a decade. Uh, you got in on this at the front. Um, I just want to thank you so much for coming on my show. You're um, welcome. And, um, and if you listen to this on iTunes, go back and uh, uh, follow this on YouTube. Our YouTube channel is uh, youtube.com forward slash Dentaltown Magazine. Or you can see it on my Facebook. What is my Facebook page? Just, just um, facebook.com, uh, Howard Ferran. Or um, or on uh, Dentaltown, but I hope you write us some articles. 
I hope you post cases on the message boards. I hope you build us an online C course and we'll even, right. we'll, even promote. we'll do anything you want to do. Thank you're, you so you're much. You're in the sweet spot of uh, the technological revolution. Thank you. I, it was a pleasure doing this and I'm, I'm excited and I'll probably do that. I take you uh, up on that and um, I think it's beneficial for everybody. Um, uh, I enjoyed this and I'm going to enjoy doing those. Um, we will talk about it. Um, that would be great. And all right, I'll, I'll appreciate this opportunity. Oh, the, the pleasure and honor was all mine. The only reason this show is popular is because I'm able to get great guests like you to come on and you just uh, rocked everyone's world. So thanks for coming on the show today. You're welcome. Thank you.